So welcome to this uh, session uh, with Lucy Kellaway. Um, the phrase needs no introduction is, is massively overused, but I think in, if you're FT readers, Lucy really doesn't need any introduction. Uh, if you by any chance don't know who she is, can I recommend you get the Weekend FT where she's written a really marvelous piece about on the front page of the Life and Arts section about her journey to become a teacher, which partly answered some of my skepticism about whether this is really a good idea or not. I'm still not totally. Um, but the, the question uh, that I'd like to start with is, it says why I gave up the nicest job in the world, the job I have as well, the columnist for the FT, uh, to be a maths teacher. So why? Why have you done it? Uh, I, just, I was just standing outside there just now, and my ex-colleague, Martin Wolf, um, came up to me and um, sort of looked at me slightly skeptically and said, how's it going? And I said, I've just done three days training at the school, and I'm even more frightened than I was before. And Martin looked at me and said, um, I would feel very sorry for you if you hadn't chosen this yourself, um, which was a sort of <laughs> typical kind of Martin Wolf. <laughs> thing. But anyway, so if I can try and think back to this time last year, I was sitting exactly here um, interviewing Tyler Brule. How many of you were there then? Gosh, so lots of you. I would say I was at sort of peak cynicism then. And I've had a total personality transplant since then. And I'm trying to reinvent myself, if not exactly as a nice person. Uh, that might be a stretch too far, but I'm trying to... I'm trying to do something that is useful. And I'm not saying that sort of taking Tyler down a peg or two wasn't useful in a kind of way. <laughs> but I want to do something that's more socially useful. And more than that, I, I had spent 32 years at the FT. And, it, you know, and I mean, you know, as you know, Gideon, it, yeah, is, it is the most fabulous job. You come to things like this, you sit and drink some champagne um, in the um, little staff um, performer's tent. I mean, it couldn't be more agreeable. But 32 years is a really, really long time. And it also occurred to me from the sort of work that I did, and so many of our readers were people sort of roughly my contemporary, give or take a decade or so, and so many of them had been doing what they were doing for simply too long. You know, the bankers had either been fired or were sort of fed up with it, the corporate lawyers even more so. Um, and there was one day that I stood in the city of London and I just couldn't see anybody of 50 or more. And I thought, where are they and what are they doing? Um, and at the same time, I always had this teacher urge. I mean, my mum was a wonderful teacher at Camden School for Girls. And my daughter was a teach first teacher. And it was really watching my daughter straight out of university and went to teach in a very tough school in Leeds. And I thought she was doing something much better than anything that I had ever done. And so I thought, I want to do this. I really do want to do it. And then I started to apply. And all the, I mean, if you go into the Get Into Teaching website, all the pictures, there are all these lovely pictures of people in their 20s. And um, it, everything about it is saying, you're too old and this isn't for you. I mean, there's also, I mean, th there's a government requirement that you have to produce your GCSE certificates. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so I'm at least 10 years too old to have even done GCSEs. I'm finding my O-level certificates was an absolute nightmare I have in the end found them. But um, so there was all of that. So I thought, I know there are people and I, the current system, although there's nothing preventing me doing it, it's not inviting me doing it. Mm. So that was why I have set up Now Teach and um, we got started last, uh, last November and so far massively proved right, at least on the first point, of how many people want to do it. And yeah. we've had a 1,000 applicants. And before you ask another question, I just want to ask anyone in the audience, is there anyone here who vaguely fancies becoming a teacher themselves? Oh, that's very good. Uh, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got the show of hands done well. Um, <laughs> but, no, I mean, my uh, suspicion that this was a kind of personal act of madness was um, slightly dispelled by looking at the incredibly impressive list of fellow madmen you've, you've, you've yeah. pulled in. I mean, they, they've done the most incredible things, uh, including a former MP, uh, 
heads of trading in big city houses? Mm. Do, do you want to give us a rundown of these people? And a sense of, do you, are you confident they'll all make it? Well, am I, uh, am I confident that I will make it myself? I have to make it, because if I've made a national news story out of changing my career, um, there's no way that I can row back. So, um, Oh, I'm sure you can. But, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, so I thought when I started this thing that it would be really a few corporate lawyers. And the corporate lawyers are there in force. I mean, corporate lawyers... Are, how many corporate lawyers in the audience, by the way? Okay, how many of you are quite miserable? <laughs> yeah, you see, there you go. Corporate lawyers are famously unhappy, and they're also famously rich by the time they're in their 50s, and so they can definitely afford to p start again on about 20 grand. So we had more corporate lawyers than you could shake a stick at applying, um, and lots and lots of bankers. But the most interesting thing is it wasn't just the predictable corporate types. We've had everybody. And so we've had sort of actors, lots of journalists. Um, we had a um, priest or two, lots of doctors. Um, it just seems to be that we all know we're going to live forever, pretty much. And by the time we've done one thing for 20 or 30 years, we want to do something else. So it's all of them. But anyway, so there were all of these people who applied. And some of the ones with the most glittering CVs, I was the keenest to get onto our program because I thought that they'd be so brilliant for public reasons but alas some of the most sort of swanky ones failed the assessment by being too swanky you've got to be quite humble if you've got to make this work but yes I mean in in, in our final 46 we have um, Kitty Usher who I think was a junior minister definitely a Labour MP um, we had somebody who was head of arts at the BBC we've had we've got two diplomats um, one of them um, was in Liberia and won some great medal for his work on Ebola. And we've got some really, really impressive people. Um, and I look at them, and half of me is thinking, this is all my fault. And well, they all absolutely hate me when they discover how punishingly hard it is. And then the other half thinks they're grown-ups, and I'm so pleased that they're with us. Yeah, I mean, hard work is one of the aspects that sounds a bit alarming. But... Uh, yeah. <laughs> But the other thing is, is the, the loss of status aspect. I mean, because these are people who, who whether they may have just got so used to it, they're not even aware of it anymore, but they are high-status individuals, and they're now going to have to learn to be humble. And it's easy enough, I think, to say, oh, yeah, I'll be fine with that. But do you think they really will be? Well, I think the humble thing and the status thing are slightly different. I mean, what we're cleverly trying to do by putting their pictures in the most sort of prestigious newspaper on earth, the Financial Times, is saying that actually teaching ought not to be low status. It ought to be incredibly high status. And that was something that Teach First did so brilliantly in persuading these very, very smart kids from the best universities not to go and work from McKinsey. Anyone from McKinsey here? <laughs> no. Excellent. Um, uh, but not to go and work for McKinsey, to, but to be teachers instead. So partly what we're trying to do is to make um, teaching much more high status. And what was the other point? Forgot. Yes, the humility thing. Oh, that humility. The, yeah, I mean, you you so now have to... Be, you're a trainee now. Yeah. At so, so I think what, what we're trying to do, which may prove too difficult, is to be both high status but incredibly humble. I mean, I just started at my school, which is Mossbourne Community Academy in Hackney, and there were three teacher training days last week. And I was sort of below the level of an intern. I don't even have DBS clearance to work with children, so I have to be accompanied by an adult at all times. <laughs> um, so I can't go to the loo on my own. Um, and um, I don't know how to sign on to the computer. I don't, well, I don't even know how to get to the loo. I mean, I, I, am, I just don't know anything at all. And so unless you feel quite humble about that, it's just not going to work. Yeah. And there was a bit in the article uh, published today... Uh, where you recount, you didn't mention this to me at the time, that somebody who had done, who had been through the process you've been through, wrote to you and said, don't do this, I did it, it was misery, I gave up after two years, and you're a Pied Piper leading people to their destruction. Did yeah. It, didn't that give you pause? Yeah, well, yeah, of course it gave me pause, but it was too blinking late by then. I mean, you know, we had already launched the thing, and of course I feel anxious about it. I haven't taught, well, I, I mean, I did a tiny little lesson um, to a class that's part of the selection process, but 
I don't know how to do this. I'm really anxious about it. So yes, of course it gives me pause. But uh, you know, if you think that you're going to fail, then you'll never do anything. But, but there is also something, how many teachers here? There's a few, and how many of you, I know there's one down in, 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 at the front, every teacher says to other people wanting to be teachers, don't do it. <laughs> Um, and, and in a way, I think teachers have to stop saying that. Um, um, although, actually, maybe there's something about all professions. I mean, when people come to me and say, I want to be a journalist, I say don't do it as well. And I'm not quite sure what's going on there, seeing it is the biggest doddle in the world and a complete laugh. So, um, but anyway, um, so, so, so the teachers, teachers are always warning you against it. But this woman was saying not only don't do it, but she was saying that you know, you're too old, you won't be able to hack it, and you'll have a nervous breakdown. So that wasn't particularly encouraging, no. Mm. Yeah. And there was another, another sentence that, that slightly worried me in the piece, where you said, you know, I've done very well throughout my life by being cynical, and now I'm going to have to stop being cynical. And uh, that, that, was, that was a bit worrying just on a personal level. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's rather an important part of you, don't you think? <laughs> Uh, well, thanks for that, Gideon. I mean, actually, although I'm laughing about it, it is re it, it's actually quite a big deal. Um, during this training thing, actually, is there anyone here who works for Mossbourne Community Academy in the room? You're narrowing it down a little bit. Um, so we're among friends, but um, <laughs> so in this, um, we were divided into groups, the teachers, and we were all had to sit through a perfect lesson given by another teacher. And this was the even experienced teachers, because it's all sort of continual learning and all of that. And so they did a lesson about the history of the school. And they asked a question about, you know, it was called, the guy who gave money for the school um, called the school after his family. And they, the question was asked to us, the pupils, what does that mean? And someone put their hands up and said, it means that family values are very important in this school. And I said, I put up my hand and said egotism, which was sort of, just the sort of general knee-jerk, sarky thing that I would say, because that's how I've made my living for 32 years. And there was this slight intake of breath. <laughs> and the person who was being the teacher went, yes, in that way that means no. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and so I just thought, I've got to reign, you know, I, I, that side of me, I just mustn't do. And, and, and the school is very, very successful. It has a way of doing things. And I must be a sort of loyal foot soldier. I mean, I've got to do things their way. And so there's no room for sort of doing sake, no, 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 no. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, I think, you know, cynicism has a bad name. But... Yeah. <laughs> But I think it's often the appropriate response. I mean, there, there are many things which deserve to be met with cynicism, as you've shown over, you know, 30 years writing columns for yes, us. But, yes, but could it be that cynicism is a privilege and um, you need to earn the privilege to be cynical and you need to know what you're being cynical about? I know nothing about how to be a teacher. And the school that I'm teaching at takes kids from very, very deprived backgrounds, does a fabulous job educating them, and more than half of them end up at Russell Group Universities. Now, I don't feel cynical about that. I feel whatever the opposite, I mean, I feel Pollyanna-ish about that. Mm. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And so I just need all the rules that I think, oh, for God's sake, yeah. why are we doing this? So that at the FT, sometimes we get official little rules that used to go around sort of saying, you've got to fill in this, that, and the other form. And I would always grandly think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not doing that. And so I have to stamp all of that out. I had an emergency dentist thing on my first day, which was a bit unfortunate. But even for that, I had to fill in a form, get it countersigned, and then offer evidence that I'd actually been at the de dentist. Um, and that... What did you do? A tooth? Or um, what? No, no, I wonder what oh, the evidence tooth. is. Yeah, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> it wasn't an extraction, actually, Gideon, but, but still... Um, uh. But yeah, so but but so it is that so it's going from a position where you are absolutely trusted. You're absolutely trusted and your your value is in what you've written. And I used to wake up in the morning and think, oh, I don't feel like going in today, I won't. Um and and so it, it couldn't be more opposite and I've just got to get used to it. 
Yeah, but I mean, I think that just uh, without wishing to labour the cynicism point, I mean, I think it's possible to make a separation between totally, of course, you can't be cynical about trying to give children an education, a chance in life. That's completely laudable. But within that, you will get all sorts of government memos, the kind of dead language that you spent your life mm. pulling apart. Are you really going to be able to read them and say, yeah, I, you know, tick the box, do all that? No, I just don't. I've, I've got to think. I, I won't have the energy for it, for a start, because actually getting cross at crap language um, is quite exhausting um, because there's so much of it. So I think I've just got to switch that off and not spend my whole life getting wound up about whatever the latest sort of rubbish, you know, strategies on education and just concentrate on what am I teaching year seven today? Um, and if I can do that, then it's all going to be all right. But do you think you will be able to do that? Because, again, some of the stuff you hear from these teachers who say, don't go into it, is you kind of get overwhelmed with all these initiatives. If it was just you in the classroom, fine. But there's a, there is a lot of box ticking, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just not even thinking about it because me in the classroom is so terrifying. So I had thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even slightly nervous talking to you. Um, Gideon, uh, you know, I haven't planned this. I haven't done my lesson plan. I can just talk to you because you're all grown-ups and it's all fine. But if you were year seven and I was trying to teach you, you know, let us say, you know, um, whatever they do in year seven. I can't even remember what they do in <laughs> year seven. <laughs> whatever. You see, I say that yes, and then you laugh and it's fine. And, and, and it's fine. But, you know, whatever they're doing, if we're doing an introduction to negative numbers, I must plan that absolutely minutely, minute by minute by minute, and then on an interactive whiteboard that I don't even know how to use, I've got to stand here looking at all 30 of you while I write the equation on the interactive whiteboard without even looking at it because I mustn't turn my back on you. So it's those sorts of things um, that are completely freaking me out, and, and I don't know how I'm going to be able to crack it. And I don't know how to put this tactfully, but... <laughs> uh, right. Is your maths up to it? I mean, you well, <laughs> well, thanks for that, Gideon. I mean, you know, among the things that I'm really, really worried about is my maths. I mean, there are so many of them, but is my maths up to it? Is re yeah, that is definitely one of them. So, um, in case any of you have children in this school, don't pull them out too quickly, um, because I'm not going to be teaching A level. I'm not even going to be teaching GCSE. I'm um, in the year 11 at first because I need to sort of prove that I can do it. So I will be doing younger kids um, at first. And I do think actually my maths is up to year seven and eight. I had a very jolly summer doing GCSE maths and I recommend it to any of you um, if you <laughs> if you're, if you have an idle moment. But actually, one other question on maths. Um, how many of you in this room think that you're useless at maths? Well, absolute shame on you. Um, and, and, and I think the fact that more people didn't put up their hands might, have, might be because you sensed it wouldn't go down particularly well with me. Um, I really have a thing about how it's socially acceptable to be useless at maths well, in this country. define useless? I think you've told me that you're useless at maths, and, and, and so shame on you. Uh, <laughs> But, I mean, no, but seriously, you know, we think it's a sort of amusing personality quirk for sort of literary people to say, oh, I just, you're just hopeless at maths. Um, and I don't think it's an amusing personality quirk at all. And, I'm, and I, I, I am going to try and be better at maths myself. So there you go. Will you just be teaching maths? Are you going to teach? I mean, you should be teaching English, shouldn't you? No, I mean, for, well, for a start, for a start, there are more than enough English teachers and maths teachers are really in short supply. Um, so that's really important. And that's so in Now Teach, we're particularly inviting um, people who can teach shortage subjects. So that's science, it's maths, it's languages. Um, so there's that. I loved maths when I was at school and, and did it. And, and, and even now, after a tiring day, I mean, you know, I've done opinions and I've done words. You can get very tired of words, really. And I get very tired of opinions. I don't want to have another opinion in my life. And, and, and a simultaneous equation is a very beautiful thing because it's either right or it's not. So, um, but, but in answer to your question, I mean, I would love to teach sixth formers and love to help them, prepare them for university or whatever they go on to do next. And I don't think my maths A level is good enough, so I will teach them economics and business studies. Very good. Uh, just a couple, a couple of love the tone. Very good. Uh, yeah. Um, before I make the audience do the work um, and get them to ask you some questions, but 
discipline. I mean, I guess the terror of your average sort of middle-class 50-year-old wouldn't be so much. might be the maths, but it might also be, oh, my God, I'm going to be put into this lawless environment and they're going to kind of rip me limb mm. from limb. Um, how... Uh, you've been at your school, Mossbourne, now for three days. I mean, you were saying that you were very struck by the immense efforts they do almost kind of military-style discipline. Yeah. I mean, I had actually thought of all the things that I was really, really worried about, controlling the class wasn't the most worrying. Um, I, I think I'm quite good at being quite frightening, and I, I think... <laughs> I, no, I really, I, I just thought if, if a good, few good teachers show me how to do it, I really do think I can do that. But actually, I think I'm barely going to need to because the school that I'm teaching in, it practically is the army. And, 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 but what's so interesting about that, so on Friday, the year sevens arrived. Um, there were sort of 220 11-year-olds who filed into the school in silence, and they spent the whole first day practicing lining up practicing moving around the school in silence, <laughs> practicing where to put their backpack in the queue. It has to be on the left, not on the right, and all of that. And the liberal in me was absolutely horrified because I just sort of thought, oh, you know, darlings, it's their first day. Just be happy, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but what is so interesting is I realized that all of that that was fine at my school and fine for my kids really is a luxury, and that actually the extreme discipline of this school, although it goes again, you know, I've never really followed a rule in my life. Um, I think it's brilliant for these schools, for, for these kids, and it's partly why they do so well. And I'm hoping that I'm going to relax and enjoy following the rules myself. I mean, rules do make life an awful lot easier, um, sort of dress codes and all of that, and um, I'm just going to follow it. Okay, um, there are plenty of you out there, so I'm sure there are lots of questions as well. Uh, the gentleman there. Hi. Um, yeah, I used to work at Mossbourne for a few years, oh, so uh, yeah, it's been quite I funny to. Uh, do you think I will be able to do it? Eventually? I think it'd be brilliant, and I think uh, a bit of cynicism and sarcasm in the classroom goes down really well with yeah. those pupils. Um, I wanted to know uh, what your thoughts are on when you um, get your start getting feedback from maybe sort of a 23-year-old uh, NQT who is your coach. Um, and it's starting to give you feedback on lessons. How are you, how are you preparing for that? You see, I think that's going to be absolutely fine because I don't think they're... I mean, they're not going to be giving me feedback. If they started giving me feedback on how I was writing or sort of something, I might be a bit annoyed, but they're giving me feedback on specific things that they know how to do and I don't. Um, and so I think that's going to be absolutely fine. I mean, I really do think that's the least of my worries. Um, but, yeah. I, I'll t I mean, the, the truth is, I don't know. I've only met my mentor is fantastic, and um, I, I love her. She's actually maybe they've given me one of the relatively ancient ones. I think she's all of thirty-two. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I think she's fantastic. Yeah. What do, What do the other teachers make of you? Do they think you're a bit bizarre? Um, <laughs> well, um, they haven't actually put it that way, uh, and I think they think that. Because th uh, there are four now teach people in this school. There's me and three relatively ancient blokes. Um, and, you know, one of them is a 60-ish former banker who's sort of very, very posh voice and sort of large character. And I can see in th that we sit around the table in the canteen having lunch and slightly weird looks are being directed <laughs> at us. But actually, mainly, they've been very, very friendly. And I think they view us as a sort of sort of amusing pets, a sort of curiosity. <laughs> um, but they've mainly been really sweet. And, and, and the fact that we really want to learn to do what they've learned to do so brilliantly, I think at the moment they take as a sort of compliment, which they jolly well ought to. Okay, somebody's waving us back here. Let's go to Captain Martin. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for coming down here, Lucy. Like many people here, I'm sure, uh, you know, my Monday mornings have been made a lot more joyful by reading your columns. Um, and recently the FT did a sort of best of Lucy, which was great. But the thought that came to my mind then was um, the internet's very accessible now, especially to young kids. And how will you deal with the fact that kids will read or read your historical archives and come into classroom with knowing sort of some of the rude things you've said about other people and challenge you on these points? Um, okay, so I have thought about that one. And um, 
First of all, I'm assured by people that the kids won't. Be, all the things they'll be looking at on the FT, mm. old FT columns of mine, they're not going to be reading them. So, uh, I mean, great if they are, that's fine, but, but it's just not going to be happening. They don't care. And, 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 and more generally, and this is brilliant too, nobody cares that I've been a columnist on the FT. So what? I mean, the, 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 the teachers don't care and the other kids don't care and they ought not to. So actually, for me, that's really, really liberating. And to the extent to which any weird kid does think it's fun to look at ancient columns from the FT, well, good luck to them. Thank you. I think I'm worried. I think that you're doing this for social reasons, and I think socially it's a terrible decision. I think that people should use rare skills, and your skill is unbelievable in making this whole tent laugh, erupt with laughter. Think amazing thoughts when we read your words. You shouldn't leave us bereft. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, that's very... I mean, that's very, very sweet and very, very flattering, but actually, I've been hogging that space for too long there are lots of other witty people who can who can who can do that too <laughs> so, yeah. so, <laughs> so 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 that's and it's I not it's not just for social reasons it's for profoundly selfish reasons too um and and s the selfish reasons are that I stopped being frightened at the FT. Fear is the most powerful motivator that there is. And two or three years ago, I mean, I used to every single week feel, n not, not exactly sick, but just feel, oh, God, was that okay? Was that awful? And, you know, uh, that keeps you writing things that are relatively okay. And I'd stopped feeling that. And even though I'm now more scared than I think I've ever been, I also feel, you know, the blood courses around my veins very agreeably. It makes me feel more alive, and that's great. So it's selfish, too. difficult uh, uh, hello hi uh, how do you think about uh, bringing some math teachers from China to teach here and uh, using the Chinese math textbooks yeah I mean I think brilliant idea um, a lot of the but I don't I don't know enough about maths in China maths in China I know that a lot of the um, way that maths is taught in Singapore has already been exported to um, to British schools um, the shortage of maths teachers is absolutely shocking maths is brilliantly done in China so any Chinese teachers who wanted to come any Chinese teachers of a certain age who fancy joining the now teach program would be more than welcome do you fancy it yourself <laughs> no apparently <laughs> but if you do we'll think about it for a rainy day anyway Thank you. Maybe just about now teach. Is um, sorry if I should know this already. Um, I haven't read your article this morning. Um, it's an organisation that you set up. Does this mean that you're going to be running your own organisation, business or not business, alongside doing the teaching? And how do you feel being on that side of management? I run a small business myself, so I'm interested to see how you would uh, feel, how you're going to cope with that kind of challenge. Well, actually, I, I, I co-founded it with Katie Waldegrave, who's a social entrepreneur, and she's always been the person who's actually um, been doing most of the work, because I was pretending to work for the FT all of last year as well. <laughs> um, they very, were very generously paying my salary in return for me doing practically nothing, so that was very, very generous of them. But um, So, no, I'm not going to be running it, um, but I am going to be continuing to talk at things. I'm being followed around by a radio um, crew practically every day day in the school, which makes it even more stressful, because I do need to continue to publicize this um, to get more people interested in doing it themselves. Um, so that is going to be difficult. As far as running a small organization goes, that's a nightmare as well. Um, absolute nightmare. And a, a small, is yours a charity as well? No. Okay, well, it, it, a charity is even worse because you've got to persuade people to give you some money. So actually, if anyone in this audience has got any money to spare, <laughs> um, and they'd like, no, seriously, it's not a joke. If any of you have got some money to, to spare and you'd like to give it to Now Teach, you come and see me afterwards too and I'll give you a hug. 
Uh, yeah, the, the woman just there. Um. Hi, um, I work for the failing New York Times, and, uh, <laughs> um, and while I don't think it's a doddle, uh, we definitely are having a lot of fun um, being Trump correspondents. <laughs> Um, and I just, uh, I, I know that a lot of journalists do go into teaching, and I was wondering what is your advice specifically to journalists and whether you do think that, on the whole, they have a lot to contribute to teaching. Um, yeah. Well, that's another question that you need to ask me in a year's time. Um, uh, do I think that there are, there are useful skills from one to another? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, what I'm hoping is the fact that I've been around a, the block many, many times will help in some sort of, you know, makes you more resilient kind of a way. Um, so I think it's, I, I think it really works like that. I, I think if you are, well, are going, as Gideon seems to think that I ought to have done into English teaching, then it probably helps a bit on that. Um, but I think it's more just people doing what they want to do. And what I hope I'm trying to prove is that it's never too late to do anything different. Um, I am 58, just in case you hadn't got that. But actually, interestingly on that, um, the oldest person who applied to us was 75. Um, he was a retired heart surgeon, and um, yeah, he actually was a bit deaf, and that was going to be a bit of a problem in the classroom. <laughs> but um, how, 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 how old is the oldest person you took? Um, there are two at 67 who are starting um, among the... Wow. Uh, and, but there's no... But, but why is that wow? I mean, you know, suppose they live till they're sort of 90 or so, which, you mm -hmm. know, they're in good nick. They probably will. Um, there's no reason why they wouldn't go on teaching for 10 years. Um, and that already is double the average length of time that someone spends in the profession. Sorry, I'm banging on too long. Yeah. Rather no. questions. Uh, Chat right uh, in the edge. Yep. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you've done a, uh, a fantastic job of um, puncturing the uh, the vanity and pomposity of the uh, of the corporate sector. But I think you wrote in a column that you, after 32 years, you'd found it had absolutely zero effect whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I, I mean, uh, it's, it's inspirational. You know, over the years reading your stuff because it's great working in a company to, to have somebody who's holding this stuff up to a proper scrutiny. But why is the corporate sector so resistant to the message about clarity and straightforwardness? Well, clarity is only good if you want to be straightforward about whatever you're doing. And um, <laughs> in the corporate sector, um, most people have an interest in not being straightforward about it. I mean, if you're in marketing, obviously you're not going to be straightforward. Um, if you're in senior management, there's a lot you can't be straightforward about. So, so there's a there's a there's a real business interest. And also, if you're a bit dim, it's better not to be straightforward, <laughs> because your um, you know your thoughts are, are probably better wearing sort of thick clothing than 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 than, than less so. So there are lots of reasons for it. But yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I'm too despairing. I can't talk about it anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> retired, defeated. Yeah. Retired, defeated, totally, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah over there. Uh, about six rows back. Oh, uh, somebody else has got the mic. We'll come, come to you next. Okay, quick. Um, I was a hotelier and then be became a teacher eight years ago and love every minute of it. But I was fortunate in teaching international students who already have this respected sir concept. How do we get teachers to have a higher status? Well, I mean, we're trying. We are trying and we'll see. And, and actually, a lot of the people just from, from today who, who are on our program um, are so delighted to have their photo in the FT and everyone they know in their networks is sort of getting in touch. And even if they're only making jokes at their expense, it is a, you know, it, it is a beginning. And you start something small like that. And if every very high status person at every blinking dinner party or whatever else they do is talking about their new job as something that they have chosen to do. I think it starts from there. Thanks. And one more quick question. Uh, how do you link mass to employability and make the case every day for it? Oh, I've absolutely no idea. But, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got absolutely no idea. No idea. But that's clearly something that, that, we, that we have to do. And I will have some better idea in a year's time and a better idea from that in five years, I think. Yeah. Uh, I've 
Bit of magic, yeah. Uh, Hi. Hi, Lucy. It's been a year since I last saw you here, and I got a goodie back from you <laughs> last year. Um, I have your very, very old book with me. I'd love for you to sign it. Sense and nonsense in the office. I truly, truly miss your podcast. Uh, the ones on business matters, on the world servers at about 2 a.m. when I can't really sleep. That's the thing that keeps me going. <laughs> so the question really is, would you, would you contemplate a new series of podcasts, Sense and Nonsense, in and out of the classroom? Well, there are a couple of things there. I mean, uh, uh, one is something that I'm really w worried about now because, of course, it's my knee-jerk reaction to write something or broadcast or do something about whatever I happen to be doing. And that's generally fine at the FT, but when you're working with kids, it's not fine. And um, Mossbourne, the sort of part, I had to make sure that I was in a school that wasn't going to be completely freaked out by a little bit of publicity. But you've got, but I really do have to be careful with um, with what I say. And also, or doing that is quite tiring. I do have to learn how to do it first. But don't worry, I mean, I will be, I, I am going to be writing 12 pieces a year for the FT, and some of those will be about what I'm doing. And I need to publicize it because I want other people to do it. And you're doing 12 pieces a year for the FT, and you're doing a BBC show. So you, in fact, you're not really retiring from journalism at all, are you? <laughs> <laughs> mm, well, you know, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be doing, no, I mean, I, in terms of the percentage of my time that I spend faffing around as a journalist, I think it'll be about 1%, and that just shows how easy journalism is and how hard teaching is. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, you've been an inspiration. Should I become a journalist? <laughs> but actually, no, you see, that's a really, really, really good question. Uh, not whether you become a journalist. Um, yeah, sure, why not? Um, <laughs> It's about all of us doing different things at whatever point of life we're, we're, we're at. So I've chosen to do this this way. But what I hope is that there will be similar schemes to encourage people. I mean, you don't look all that old. Um, but, it, it, you know, encourage people to do completely different things with their lives in their 50s and 60s that aren't all about having a sort of portfolio existence or whatever it was that Charles Handy thought we should all be doing, um, but are about starting all over again. And, I mean, the FT hired a couple of relatively ancient geezers who had been in the city um, to, to go on the Lex column in their 50s. And I thought that was absolutely great, and we should be doing more of that. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you... Uh, I th I seem to remember you once said to me that you thought that my slightly, uh, not hostile, but kind of questioning attitude of what you were doing was because I felt threatened by it, <laughs> which uh, I've always denied. But I, 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 I wonder whether, listening to you, whether you're saying that there is something bad about just going on doing something that you're quite good at for a long time. I mean, should Martin Wolf become a teacher? Um... Mm. Actually, I wouldn't have let Martin Wolf onto our program. So there you go, Martin. Had he applied, he would have failed at the first thing he's ever failed at in his entire life. But um, no, no, I don't think. I mean, no, I, I don't think there's anything bad in going on doing the same thing forever, if you still find it as enjoyable as you used to. And if you don't find it as, it as enjoyable as you used to, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we've all got other things that we could do and maybe it's a good idea to try, th try it sometimes. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> guy in the middle... I, I didn't mean to sound too disparaging. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question to you is about the, the health and safety sort of regime in UK schools and uh, in the UK in general. Do you think it's fine as it is? Are you cynical about it? How do you compare it versus other countries you may have been to? Um, actually, I'm going to refuse to answer that question. Uh, at the moment, I'm feeling so stressed that if I start worrying about health and safety as well as everything else, I think I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of absolute health and safety. Not, I mean, I, I, I actually think that, that not the fact that I can't even wander around the school without being accompanied is a bit silly because what am I going to do to the kids? But that is the law and that's just how it's got to be. And I, it goes back to what we were saying earlier. I'm going to try not to object too much to all of that and just get on with it. Uh, we have a school-aged child here who will ask you a question. How do you plan to deal with misbehaving students? <laughs> oh, well, you see, now that's a very good one. Um, and um, I'm going to give them a detention. 
and I am going to give them a detention. I mean, in, in the school where I'm teaching, um, I was just looking at one of the um, class lists that my mentor is going to have next year, and one kid got 182 detentions last year. <laughs> Um, so there are a lot of detentions, and they are used, and they're used for... I mean, my m real worry is it being in detention myself for not giving enough detentions to the kids. <laughs> but but I, I, I think that in the school that I'm in, it's easy because there is such a framework for, 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 for all of that. But you look at them all the time, and if they are breaking the rules, you uphold the rules and you give them a detention. I think I'm going to quite enjoy it, actually. <laughs> okay, we've got, we got, uh, got lots more questions, so... Uh, Given your cynicism, yep. from what you've just said, do you think detentions uh, work? 182 a year? Very effective. Well, see, look, this is really unfair, all these questions. I have been in the school for three days, <laughs> and the kids don't even arrive till Monday. So ask me next year. All I can say is, in this particular school, they take kids who did not behave well in their primary school, and they do behave well in school, and they get fabulous results if something's going right. When you announced this, Sorry. Sorry, yeah. um, I rang you and said, can I have your old job? Because I thought it was such a, such a brilliant idea and I thought you were absolutely mad. But at the same time, deep within me, I recognised what you were talking about, about being some deeply selfish satisfaction out of making this change. And for everybody else, because I don't want to do it, but for everybody else, could you articulate even more the deep selfish satisfaction that comes out of it so they can want to do it too? Oh, well, thank you, Peter, for that. I, I, um, yes, I can talk about selfishness for a very long time. Um, I think, but it is about fear. It's about being, you know, so I've been waking up in the morning at about five the last few days because I feel so excited about this. And clearly, if I go on and on waking up at five forever, there'll be nothing left of me. But, but it is a very agreeable feeling, learning new things and sort of... I, I'm definitely not going to say the dread phrase comfort zone, um, but you know what I mean. In trying to do something all over again is deeply and profoundly exciting. OK, the chap here. Lucy, I've got a bit of advice for you about the detentions. Forget about the detentions. My maths teacher, when you misbehaved, used to write your initials on the board, and if you had your initials written once, you had to write one preface of the maths book, and it, if you misbehaved again, you got SC squared, and that was two prefaces of the maths book. <laughs> and I think you'll find that the maths book is com preface is completely unintelligible and very hard to write out. Um, can I just say that squared shouldn't mean doubling? Um, <laughs> just a mathematical point. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm very impressed by your maths knowledge. <laughs> um. Hi, Lucy. Um, it must have been a period of time of you thinking about this is what you've been sharing, but was there one moment, one pivotal moment, when you went, that's it, that your final decision was made? Yeah, I think I've been thinking about it sort of forever, watching my mum and then watching my daughter. And it's interesting, if you look at the 46, lots of them have teaching in the blood somewhere. Not all, but quite a few. And yes, there was, there was a moment, and this also, the other 46, when my dad died, I suddenly came back to the FT and I thought, why am I doing this? And suddenly, it's very weird after a bereavement, you do feel very different. And everyone said, oh, don't do anything radical because you're not really yourself. And I thought, no, this is the moment to do something radical because I probably wouldn't dare otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, I think dad died in May and by June we, had, we were going to do this and start it up, so yes. And can I ask, did you have a, a circle of people that you really spoke to about this? Was it family or friends? Was there a group of people who helped you think out well, loud? I, I mean, I talked to my daughter, and then I just decided to do it. Because if you talk to too many people, then you can talk yourself out of it. So I didn't do that. Okay. Um, woman in the, in the middle, sitting on the floor. Uh, um, did you talk to any 11-year-olds about what they thought about being taught by untrained professional retreads? Oh, um, okay. So, on that, we haven't invented a new 
training program. So there is already something called Schools Direct um, for, for teachers of any age we're using the same training program. So um, I'm as untrained as a 22-year-old would be beginning teaching. So um, does an 11-year-old feel weirder as having me as a novice than a 22-year-old? I think there's something strange about 11-year-olds that they think a grown-up is a grown-up and that they may not have actually noticed... Well, maybe I'm slightly kidding myself, but they may not have noticed that I'm not 22. No, actually, I think they might have noticed. In fact, actually, now take it all back, um, one of the year sevens, I was trying to sort of help him with something. Um, he said, oh, yeah, this is a real downer. He said to me, um, do you work here, miss? Um, and so I sort of very firmly said yes. And he said, oh, I thought you were a visitor. Um, <laughs> so I'll have to look more teacherly in future. Well, look, we've got millions of questions, but I think this tent yes. is scheduled to be used by other people in about 10 minutes, so I think we've got to pack it up. I'm really sorry about that, but I think it's a great sign that you've got so many people still wanting to ask you questions, and perhaps they can corner you afterwards. I don't um, know. Yeah, can I just uh, say, I'm going to stand outside there. Anyone who wants to be a teacher, come up to me, and anyone who wants to give now teach any money, come up to me. And I'll deal with the people who want to give money first, because they're more <laughs> important, and there are fewer of them. There are millions of people who want to teach, but if you do too, fantastic, and I'll talk to you in a bit. Bye. Okay.